got about entering the light out of the darkness, which is where I am heading into this. The symbol of Batman is usually a bat surrounded by a yellow oval, so we've got a man right in the middle of the continent. When I was in third grade, I grew up outside of Atlanta before I moved, um, and the kid after class showed me how to draw Ninja Turtles, and that became our thing. It wasn't just his thing. We used to ask Cedric all the time, draw me Michelangelo, and one time after class, he's like, Dean, it's so easy. You just draw this oval and this bigger one, and the nose, and the mask, and you got a Ninja you just color it whichever mask color you want. I love that because a lot of times people who have skills want to compete as if these are a zero-sum game. We're all playing different games. The more talented people there are making good things, the better it is for everyone. And so to share magic with them. I don't know if you know Batman's origin, but he loses his parents. He makes a candlelight vow, which is the thing they always leave out of movies. I, I really think it's important to understand that Batman's an eight-year-old's response to something that doesn't make sense. Because a 20-year-old who's kicked out of college doesn't go become the world's greatest crime fighter. He donates money to security firms or the police, or tries to fund victims associations or something like that. An eight-year-old says, I will become the thing that I didn't have that night, and dedicates his life to it. It's this drive that a child has and the imagination that a child has. But he goes and he becomes a master scientist, trains his body to a level of perfection, and then they're not afraid of him. And a bat flies through his window. And he's like, I will become a bat. This is the bat that flew through my window. It's so strange for <coughs> her entire life. My career, my fandom, this story that saved my life. It all because we had a movie day in fifth grade. Everybody likes Batman when you're a kid. But knowing why he does what he does changed how I perceived him, and it changed how I perceived my life. That terrible things could happen. Bruce Wayne could have become a criminal, you gotta understand. Dude had enough money to do whatever he wanted. He could have become a villain. He could have been so disillusioned that he never did anything useful. But instead, he tries to help others. This is the first time I was bad. I don't know where my Batman shirt came from, the first one. It's funny, after working on this book, I went and bought like five of those yellow oval shirts. This one isn't one today. It's Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. It's the current X-Men comics. I have five of these yellow oval shirts so that I can cosplay as myself. <laughs> My sister said this uh, bedroom panel was inaccurate because there aren't enough posters. I really enjoyed working on this, uh, this book. This panel, I think, is probably the saddest one for me in the story. I didn't mention that yet in this class, right? No. That was a lot of class. This is the separation that I lived with. My son and I are always very close. We have a bond, I think most parents would understand, but um, because I only have the one kid and, and I only know my experience, it feels really powerful. I feel like I understand what he's thinking. Again, working with kids my whole life, I'm pretty good at understanding what cries matter when they're babies, whether it's hungry or sad. And then even his level of communication, he has a speech impediment, it's like speech impediment with his R's and I never misunderstand them, which is probably not helping because I'm like, oh, just understand. <laughs> but this separation that I had from him in terms of you know bath time and changing diapers, uh, I've read a lot of people who, uh, parents who were victims, had the same fear because storytellers have told us that we're monsters. It's funny though that this panel that makes me the saddest is actually my favorite drawing. I think that pretty good look. That sounds neat to him. He's really wonderful. These comics are by Grant Morrison, again, my favorite writer. He has a lot of stuff about alternate realities and superheroes. During the 80s, there were a lot of books like The Dark Knight Returns, which meant a lot to me as a kid, and Watchmen and things like that that often show 
how superheroes wouldn't work in the real world because selfishness and greed and corruption would enter into things. Uh, it'd just be bad sometimes. That era was called the deconstruction era of comics. In the late 90s, we entered the reconstruction era with writers like Grant, Mark Wade, and Kurt Busiek saying, what if we just let the superheroes be what they say they are? Yeah, Superman's always going to win. There might not be a lot of tension. Maybe I gotta throw something bigger at the guy than another dude to punch. Maybe something really existential or huge, like the concept of reality or that Superman finding out that his cells are dying because he flew through the sun and they've overcharged. And what is Superman gonna do with his last few months on Earth? That's a good story, by the way. Flex Mentality, though, was about processing his childhood and dealing with the idea of the multiverse, right? Because physicists believe in the multiverse. Um, if that's true, and if it's infinite, then every option you can imagine is explored in real universes. Now, that's a big concept, right? But if you're a big sci-fi nerd like me, that sounds pretty legit, right? So, if I am one of these guys who works on Batman and Superman, and I know that the multiverse is real, and I know that Batman and Superman sometimes go to other universes, what happens if I bring Batman to save me when I was a kid? And I was literally terrified to draw that comic for about a year because I thought I might find that all the time. <laughs> but I eventually did it because I realized I already had the idea. So if I had the idea, I drew it just to make myself feel better. And I really did. And I realized what Batman would say to me, I started crying. Of course he'd come. Everybody. And that same day, it's just because I've been thinking about it and I've drawn the thing, I decided to read the Wikipedia entry on child sexual abuse and found out that the fear I've been told in my life was nonsense. I could finally put that on that gun. Seems strange that Batman fan would use gun imagery, doesn't it? But I grew up around him, and Batman would say to me what he always says. I like those little fire bats. This story is about choosing who you want to be. And it's about not letting what happens to you destroy you. And I think it's a little bit about not letting other people's idea of who you are box you in. But mainly it's about how rad Batman is. <laughs> One of the things I really like about Batman is the no powers thing, the end is an option. Uh, I think a lot of people relate to Batman because of that. Batman, though, is, is a thing that's been going for 75 years, and it's a it's kind of a spectrum. You know, we've had silly Batman plenty of times. We have vengeful Dark Knight. We have the scientist detective Batman. The original Batman used guns before Bill Finger wrote the origin story. <laughs> He's going around like a shadow, and then it's like, oh, wait, what about this? And then no, no more. Uh, thousands of poor artists and writers pouring their hearts into this character synthesized across decades. This time travel collaboration where the characters get better decade after decade after decade as new ideas are brought in across <laughs> media, by the way. Kryptonite and Jimmy Olsen come from the radio show when they filter back into Superman. The Crystal Fortress from the uh, 70s movie of Superman. That's in the comics now. It's filtered back to the source. It's like we're all working on this Superman theory and this Batman theory. What are these guys? How are they relevant now? How are they useful now? And the core always states, you are who you choose to be. Use all of your abilities to help everyone you can. One of the other things I like about Batman is that unlike some of the other superheroes, and again, I'm a huge superhero fan, I don't think there are bad characters. I think any character uh, in the superhero worlds can be written well. Put a good writer and a good artist on the book, it's going to be a good book. But Batman in particular has this inherent quality because he comes from such a horrible crime that as a victim of a horrible crime, I feel like he could be in my world. Batman has these black boots. 
leaves that aren't stained by walking down the crime alleys of my life, the way Superman's or Spider-Man's might be. I don't think you can have Captain America in a story this horrible that I've had to live through. The Batman will be there for me. Drawing this picture took about two weeks, 120 hours. There are 116 characters in that. That's me behind Wolverine. I usually have brown hair. At least for a costume. I'm not just trying to look like Elsa. <laughs> Man, I love that movie though. That song, Let It Go, felt like such a thing for me. Uh, fear of people finding out what you're really about, then finding out, and then finding out what you're capable of. That was a good movie. I really want to draw like a fan art ice Batman. As you can see, I've got characters from all across genres and media, but it's it's kind of a DNA print of my fandom. I feel bad about the few I left out that I really like, but I think I got the majority of ones that really touched me. Marty McFly from Back to the Future. Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell, but he was kind of a jerk. You remember him as being this cool guy, but he really just liked his friends a lot. I redesigned all the costumes because I love superhero costumes. I tried to pretend that I've been writing book, books for a little while. Put Kyle back in charge of Adrian Lantern. And promoted Batgirl's Batwoman. But these are these are my guys. I sell this as a poster now called You'll Be Safe. It hangs in a lot of kids' bedrooms and that makes me feel really If you get the chance to tell a story that you're afraid to tell, and you know how to do it in a way that will help others who have had similar experiences, I cannot recommend it enough. I go to cons now, and people come up to me and they start crying before they can say a word because the pain of this crime is so strong and you feel so alone because no one talks about it. And to be the thing that I needed for others is a And that's kind of my talk on Batman stuff. If anyone has any questions, I promise I will speak extemporaneously for a good five, ten minutes. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about how comics are made? Superheroes. If you need to know who would win in a fight between one superhero or another, I have an actual degree in comics, which is really cool. <coughs> if you want to impress 12 year olds. <laughs> the answer is Batman. What are you working on now? Is it difficult or wonderful or both to, to go to the next, or you may already get the next project, but this seems so, I have spoken for you. you know? it yeah. It really is like a statement. Yes. What are, you, are you working on something now or what do you envision coming next? Or is I that an issue? It's, it's also kind of a statement, but it's not a true story. You know, some people wanted me to do uh, another autobio piece after this one. I'm like, dude, I, I really just had this one thing I want to talk about. I, I kind of feel like in five or six years I might do one on divorce because I feel like an advocate. <laughs> if you're in a terrible relationship, really fail because people give a lot of bad relationship advice. You just have to look it out. Everybody fights. If you don't know the level to which everybody fights, and some things aren't ever going to resolve, I think you should hold out for that Disney princess, the perfect person. I feel like I have. But yeah, the next thing is, is uh, back to superheroes. Um, but it is kind of a statement in a way because a lot of the comics these days have lost some of the things that matter to me. They've become, and I sound so funny to any my I don't know what In order to appeal to the majority of people who buy comics, one of the companies has gotten so far down the path of marketing to 35-year-old, video gaming, uneducated, white, sexist, douchebag. That's the target demo, because they did like a Nielsen rating uh, thing with comics and this poll, and it's upper middle class, not very smart, white dudes reading the majority of comics. 35-year-old is the median age. 
It's not comics not for kids. And I, I don't mind that comics aren't just for kids anymore. That's often the part. Like, if you see an article in the newspaper about comics, if pal, comics aren't just for kids, that's going to be the title. But I think marketing just to guys who like lots of sexy girls who are problems for the men in their lives, and men have to come straighten them out, and uh, a lot of the legacy characters, because uh, comics often reset to, it was, it was, there have been several Green Lanterns for example. But if you reset back to the most well-known Green Lantern all the time, you're back to a character from the 50s. If you're doing that for all your characters, all your characters are back to being white males. In comics, we've had this legacy thing. In the 90s, when I was reading comics, Green Lantern was Hispanic, and there were like several black people in the Justice League, and there's, you know, women and stuff in roles, and then if you keep rebooting back to the core ones everybody knows, those were all created in the 50s and 60s when they were all written by white males and they're all white males. I am really annoyed by that. I'm really annoyed by the lack of diversity and female heroes and stuff like that. Um, so I'm kind of doing a superhero book. That's kind of how I want it to be. It's not like a mission statement on diversity. It's a mission statement on heroism. You know, the Justice League now in the comics is really adversarial and they fight with each other a lot. So if you look at any comics cover right now, the most popular thing you'll see is a superhero versus another superhero on the cover. This goes back to The Dark Knight Returns, which was done in 1986 when Superman fought Batman. Batman had been retired and all superheroes had been outlawed. He comes out of retirement to save Gotham from this huge mutant problem, these, these, this gang called the mutants, and uh, the government isn't okay with it, so they send Superman in to stop them, even though they're best friends. And that fight was one of the most engaging and crazy things that's ever happened in comics. It was amazing. And Batman, like, wins, and then fakes his own death, so it's like he loses. Batman can't even lose without winning. And uh, Superman figures it out later, and it's like, but um, that fight was such a big moment. They're basing the new movie around that idea. But in comics, it's like they'll have one Green Lantern versus another Green Lantern, Superboy versus Supergirl, and guys, crying. There's crime right over there. Like you can, there's not one of those I feel like the DC Universe must be having the hugest crime spree ever in the background of all their comics. Because while I'm not against telling more adult stories with superheroes or against there being room for that kind of stuff. I feel like they think that we can't handle the good guys, that we want these complex characters. And obviously, when you're telling uh, fictional stories, a lot of times you want complex, flawed characters. I'm a big fan of the show Justified. Uh, I think The Wire is one of the best shows ever on television. Um, complex, flawed characters, really well written. Superheroes are a different thing, though. It sounds so preachy about it, but they're this aspirational force that benefited me so much that I'm a little passionate about it. I like the ideas of Batman and Superman being pals. They're kind of like, I don't know if you've ever seen the old World's Finest covers. World's Finest was the Superman Batman team up book in the 40s and 50s. And the covers were all like, not about the interiors where they had two stories, like adventure stories. The covers would just be Batman, Superman, and Robin goofing off. Just like having fun on the weekend. It's like Batman had adopted this kid and Uncle Superman's there to play and they'd make go-karts with their symbols on it, go racing, or just be out skiing, or Batman versus Superman in basketball, <laughs> Robin's refereeing. It's like they raised this dude. Those are canon in my mind. It's Dick Grayson's early life. But now it's all adversarial. Uh, I feel like it's a little cheap. I think if you don't like the idea or don't believe in the idea of courageous, hopeful, selfless people who really are driven to help and are honest and sincere about it, it says so much more about you than it does about them. When people are like, Superman's too white bread. So, so you make a movie where Superman's a jerk and nobody likes it. They did so much better with Captain America being such a good guy. They out Superman, Superman. Kind of out badass him too. As you can see, even the tiniest question will get me going. Anybody got one? Yeah. Um, I 
Anyone have a favorite superhero? Mike does. Who is it? Uh, Superman. <laughs> Superman. <laughs> of the secrecy. I'm, I'm kind of, I had one secret in my life uh, that I wouldn't tell people about, and it kind of led me to being pathologically honest. It's hard for me to keep secrets. It's hard for me to lie about things. I will if I have to. If I have to lie in a situation, it means the whole system is messed up. But uh, by getting this one last thing out of my life, I, I can't tell you how good it feels. Um, if you have a thing that's holding me down, I really would open up to the friends, like really slowly. That's what I did when I was going to tell the stories. So Ben and I, like I said, had this conversation where I opened up to them. I copied that entire text uh, conversation out of uh, iMessage, and I would email my friends and say, listen, I'm working on this book, and it's about this thing I've never told you about. And uh, I pasted it in this conversation where I explained it, and I'm trying to slowly open up to friends to get used to it because it's going to be public and it'll never be secret again. And I slowly did it with friends because I had to get used to the idea of people knowing and my fear of rejection was so baseless. People were so, like they're your friends. They know who you are more than you realize. You know, they are on your side. And if they're not, you will feel this huge, justified disagreement with them. Where it's like, if you aren't on my side and I've been through this, then like, we're done. Uh, one of the things about working on this book is uh, my biological father's sister started writing me these angry letters because he lied to her about the breakup and said, no, your mom was cheating on him. And it's like, dude, I'm, I'm really close to my mom. The story backwards and forwards, and I traced his life. I know what he did. He lied to me. And it's fine if you want to be on your brother's side. How many kids does that dude gotta leave before you're not on his side? I traced his life and he moved to California and had another kid. I really want you to guess what he did. That's it. 
that's right, it was the, I call it a do-over. <laughs> I don't really know. And she left that kid too. That's this, this, there's a cognitive dissonance with this lady and her sister, and instead of, because she admitted to me that she'd had similar uh, sexual violence in her childhood, instead of relating to the story and feeling like, oh God, this is what you've been dealing with, I understand why all this has you know, gone on, this anger with your father. Uh, instead it was like, yeah, well something bad happened to me and I didn't blame my dad for it. Well, maybe it wasn't your dad's fault, but it was mine. He was supposed to be there for us. My mom went on a date and accepted an offer of babysitting. I'm really glad the police got involved. My mom was really good about it. You know, the family was uh, a deacon in our church, and uh, his teenage son was molesting all the kids at her mom's daycare. And if my mom hadn't gotten involved, the other six victims wouldn't have had any help. You know, I get messages from people whose parents don't believe them. I cannot tell you. When someone's mom doesn't believe them, I am so lucky to have had the circumstances around this whole thing because I had a great mom. My stepdad was dating my mom at the time, and he would come back, want to come back early from dates to read me and Jen's stories. That's a good dude. I didn't think I could love that guy more until I found out he was there for a string this year because I didn't know that. Like I said, uh, in my other classes, my memory is really good. This, this porch and this room are all I have for that. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to call it. Thank you so much. So if you guys want to hang out, talk to Dean uh, one on one, you're welcome to. Uh, we'll be around for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>